Cool, everybody. Well, hey, we have a great video today to kick off our new Optimize LAC channel. Um, we are joined by two fantastic Watchman implanters. We have Elliot Groves from Mills Peninsula Medical Center, the head of structural heart there. Good friend of mine and a fantastic uh, Watchman implanter, really smart guy. And then we are joined by the illustrious Tom Wagner, the number one Watchman implanter in the world. Good friend of mine, and he is a fantastic operator. He's had really Good experience with the Watchman Flex Pro, which we'll be talking about today. And uh, he's got some great slides to show us on the new technology. So Tom, take it away, brother. We're really excited to have you and Elliot here today and, and to hear more about Watchman Flex Pro and your experience. Excellent, guys. Uh, thanks, guys. A shout out to Murmur and D and what Joe, you guys have done here is phenomenal. It's a great learning platform and we're just excited to help share technology. Elliot, awesome. pleasure. Let's uh, get to this together, guys. Awesome. Some disclosures. Okay, so program highlights. Uh, you know, why did Joe come knocking at my door? Because we are a high volume Watchman program. We do about twelve to fifteen a week. You can see nationally all time we're in the top ten. And in twenty twenty two, we finally peaked at number one. We do again high volume LA closure. A little bit of background about about the Watchman program. If you look at Flex and Flex Pro and what has developed over the last twenty years, literally twenty years. The first pilot was in two thousand two. And now we're looking at technology 20 years later that is medicated. So in 2020, uh, you know, we had the approval of the Watchman Flex, which really was a game changer. You know, we saw there was about 25 to 30 percent of our cohort that had complex anatomy. We felt that we couldn't close with the initial Watchman device, Gen 2.5, we call it. Now this new Flex changed the game. We increased our productivity in Watchman implants by about 25 percent just with that change. Fast forward to 2023 in September, we had approval for Watchman Flex Pro, which is the new medicated device, has a hemocode on it. The trial Heal LA is enrolling currently. It's a post-market approval study that we're going to look at for this new technology in reduction of DRT, improved seals, and larger LA closure implants with the new 40 millimeter device, the Watchman Flex Pro Plus. So this is an exciting time. If you think back, Joe, to 2002, the initial pilot study, and that year, the first Tabor was done, the first mitral tear was done within 12 months, the first Watchman and the first drug-coated stent. Crazy, man. It was just an exciting time the last uh, 20 years, starting in 2002. So the Watchman, the whole platform, it is the most studied device in LA closure. Over 300,000 patients have been implanted over 20 years with 10 clinical trials. So an exciting time with some great technology. Absolutely. So spend a few minutes on this and, um, and and look at the technology. So as you guys know, the initial Watchman Gen 2.5 was dangerous in some regards, if people might say. The complication rate was only 1.5%, but it literally, Joe, had 10 feet coming out of the tip of that spear, a 14 French guide. You know, it's amazing that we as operators it didn't have more complications. I think about that every time I do a Watchman Flex now. I'm like, I can't believe, I can't believe we were putting that... That, that like spear into the left atrial appendage, it's so much more less traumatic now. Elliot, do you remember those days? I mean, just uh, the Gen 2 fives, it was just, uh, you know. Yeah, I, I remember the first time I perforated an appendage with that. <laughs> it was yesterday. Um, yeah. It was, I was a fellow and yeah, it was, it's a, it was not a pleasant thing to deploy. It was kind of the, that butt pucker moment. Yeah. It's, it's amazing that <laughs> the complication rate was only 2.5% with that, you know, and some, and, and most centers is down to 1.5 by the end of the end of the study. So, uh, so moving on to, to Watchman Flex, now it has the 18 strut frames that are woven together in a flex ball type uh, 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 formation or configuration. This configuration allows you to have some flexibility, a safety ball, they call it. So you can push against the back wall of the appendage if you need to, we don't recommend it, but if you do have contact, it's less traumatic. You can see in the flex pinnacle tier data that Cybal Car presented, the complication rate was only 0.5%, down from 1.5% with the initial Gen 2.5. Procedural success and complete seal were 98.8 and 89.5. So that's pretty remarkable when you look at the yeah. data long term. Absolutely. So uh, moving forward to the Watchman Flex Pro, uh, this is the new device. And the reason they developed this is there are some unmet clinical needs, if you will looking at DRT. So device-related thrombus ranges from 2 to 4% at 12 months, depending on the study you look at. So it still has an unmet clinical need in saying, hey, guys, we're putting a device in here. We do not want to clot on this device. So that is uh, the purpose of the hemocote, which we'll talk about. 
the post-approval monotherapy study, which will be developed, it's called Simplify. It's going to look at SAPT versus DAPT versus low-dose DOAC. I think this will be a very important study when you think about the new technologies that will be in this competitive field over the next five years. The third one is reduced untreatable LAAs, meaning large orifice LAAs of over 31.5, which is the current cutoff for the 31 millimeter device, or excuse me, the 35 millimeter device. And finally, the improved seal performance. I think the conformability of this device is really remarkable, and that hopefully is going to have a seal of over 90%. So yeah, those, in those your experience, just a quick question. In your experience, my only issue with Wash and Flex right now is the heavily trabeculated appendages where you you get that kind of leak in between the trabeculation and the device have you have you found that flex pro mitigates some of that in those cases joe i think so i think the conformability now is remarkable what i do is i'll form the flex ball a partial flex ball in the deepest trabeculation i'll pull back and withdraw the device let the full flex ball form so the distal anchors which 30 percent of the radial force of that device anchor into that pectinate and then unsheath the rest of the device so I would say compared to Gen 2.5, I, I, I would shy away from trabeculated appendages. I, I don't think it was the right technology. With the new Flex and Flex Pro, I think the conformability of the device allows it to you know, really accommodate. The one challenging anatomy, and I'd love to hear your comments on this as well, that I still feel that probably a dual system closure is best is an anterior chicken wing with shallow depth and osteal posterior pectinate. Yeah. That, for me, is a challenging anatomy. If you implant it too deep, you miss the osteopectinate, and the risk of thrombus is still there and elevated. If you come too proximal to get the pectinate, you have a large shoulder, and your risk of having the device shift or move is uh, is palpable. Elliot, what are your thoughts yeah, on that? Yeah, totally agree with you. I mean, that that is really the, the place where the dual seal devices kind of shine, I think, because you can bury that lobe, so-called lobe, in, the, in that anterior chicken wing and not worry about missing that really osteal pectinate so yeah i totally agree with you i think you know it's those, those are the challenging ones and, and i like your description of your deployment technique even just in trabeculated appendages in general to not sub select you know because that's one issue if people try to deploy too deep um and i think we've learned that's actually not the way to do it that you end up sub selecting and and uh the feet don't really grasp the appendage so yeah i totally agree with you about that that being a challenging anatomy and that's a very important point, Joe, because keep in mind, when, when you have 30% of that radial force in the distal anchors of the Watchman Flex Pro and Watchman Flex systems, those configurations, when you're constrained, if these are the anchors, my thumbs, that's what happens, right? It looks like a bullet shaped. You yeah. want them out and rotate it out. So you want it to flower and look like a bell pepper shape, right? Yeah. If it's bullet shaped and constrained, the distal anchors are in. And that's a really, really important point. So if it looks like a elongated bullet, your distal anchors are not engaged. So 30% of the device is not being anchored. Yeah, that's a great point. Okay, so let's move on here. So here, a little bit more about the pro technology, which, you know, Boston's excited about. The whole space is excited about. I mean, this is the first medicated device in the LA space. And this is exciting. So, uh, you know, the Hemocote will show a few slides about what the healing pathology looks like. Obviously, the large device, the 40 millimeter, again, to treat up to 6 to 10% of your, your population currently, and the new radiopaque markers, which I find helpful when you do the tug test, when you align them coaxial to the appendage orifice. So this is, again, really built on, you know, a lot of data, a lot of cases, over 300,000, and the preclinical models have really shown that this new technology is really important to help and promote healing. We want endothelization not thrombus to form on the device during that first six week healing phase. So this is a couple slides of some bench work. If you look at first on the left side, this is less platelet binding. So you have over a 25% reduction in platelet binding, okay? So the top slide on the left side, the less platelet binding slide is coating on the top, the black, and then uncoated right below that, the red. So what you don't want is to have platelets bind to this acutely, that promotes DRT and thrombus formation. So you want the top slide where we block platelets, allow the proteins to endothelize, so DRT does not occur in that first six week phase, the healing phase, which is most important. And that is really built upon the next slide, the middle slide. So you have about an 85% reduction in inflammation in those first three days because of the inhibition of platelets to bind to the hemocoating. And that's really, really important when you think about DRT. The risk of DRT is currently only 2 to 
However, this is hopefully going to drop their thinking less than a half a percentage point. So I think it's very, very important in the space when you talk about competitive, you know, competitive devices. The third, uh, on the right side, the less thrombus, that's all built into this. Less platelet binding, less inflammation, and less DRT. A 70% reduction or greater of DRT at 14 days. Joe, what are your thoughts about that? I mean, <clears throat> this is exciting, man. I mean, this this really does seem like it's the drug eluting stent uh, iteration uh, of of this space. And I can tell you, DRT. I mean, because we do CTs on all of our post watchmans, and we see a lot of stuff on CT that you wouldn't otherwise see on TEE, and it's very disconcerting. I mean, there's just so much gray area in terms of what to do with some of this stuff we see on these devices, and. There's nothing worse than telling a patient whose goal is to get off anticoagulation that they have to go back on it. So DRT in my in my mind is the bane of uh, of of Watchmen right now, and and so this is super exciting for me. Absolutely, Ella. Your thoughts about this? Let me ask you: Do you still do the twelve month imaging with TE or CT, or do you just skip and do the forty five? So we actually don't even do the forty five. So what we do is we anticoag we try to get everyone on a DOAC and aspirin for forty five days, and then we take them off. And then we do a three month TE or CT. I like so that. That's what, been, that's what we've been doing. Just because we feel we feel like the logic behind that is that you're not gonna see necessarily DRT, particularly in people who are on full dose anticoagulation. It's very rare. Yeah. But where you're gonna see it is at three months when they've been off it for you know 45 days. So that's kind of the way we try to streamline our program and and make it easier for patients. We could probably have a maybe a somewhat similar patient population to you, generally older um you know more visits they're a little resistant to that kind of stuff so but yeah i think this is this is incredible i mean this is a amazing technology it's it's long overdue and and i think it will also you know as all of us being interventional cardiologists we know that patient that we that we talked to about watchmen who had an end stemi and, and or a stemi and they have an afib and they'd be better off even we know from a mortality benefit on ticagrelor or prasigrel but we're not putting patients on ticagrelor and Pixaban, 5 bid and that's just a disaster. Yeah, yeah that's a, a very, very uh, great point you made. And just to highlight that and kind of reiterate, you know, if you basically what you do is similar to the Champion AF protocol, which is the lowest trial, as you guys know, comparing DOAC to a Watchman Flex. That's a five-year uh, follow-up uh, endpoint. And in that protocol, what we did, which the trial is now closed, is you had them on their blood thinner for 90 days. You stopped the blood thinner for four weeks. You then re-image them at day 120. So at four months, so OAC for three months, off therapy, image at four months. That makes sense. And, and you know, just to dovetail off your your comment, we've been imaging these patients while they're on their blood thinner, or the day we stop it at day forty five. We would expect no DRT, unless they have some sort of you know uh, you know blood uh, clutching or uh, resistance to to DOACs, if you will. So I think the protocol of Champion F is really important clinically, where we image after they're off their blood thinner at least a month later. Yeah. That will help pick up DRT. And that's a protocol that was in Champion F, and hopefully we can extrapolate that. I think we'll see this similar to ACS, guys, when you have like a, an acute STEMI. They're on you know DPT for 12 months per guidelines. If it's an elective PCI, stable angina, you can do three to six months, right? It's going to be scaled. If they're a high risk bleeder, you could do 30 day uh, DAPT post PCI. So I think we'll see a, a scaled approach to this, you know, a regimen post implant based on their bleeding risk and their stroke risk. And hopefully that'll come to fruition in the next couple of years. Uh, uh, very what good. are you guys doing for your post uh, post Watchman anticoagulation imaging? So we do uh, at three months. So we depending on the bleeding risk, if they're high bleeders, I stick with the IFU and do 45 days. Uh, if it's someone that's a, a you know not a high risk patient, they've had an ulcer in the past, but it's not bleeding currently. I'll wait three months into imaging off OAC. Got it. Yeah, to look for DRT. I, I, the two two to four percent in the data is important to understand that this was predominantly on patients who were on their blood thinner at the time of imaging. Yeah, that's a great point. I never thought that. that data clinically, it's likely much higher the rate of DRT. If you don't look, you won't find it. Okay, very good. Let's uh, move on to the next slide here. So this is some of that coded uh, technology versus the uncoded. So the slide on the in the middle. So this is six of six exhibits, complete coverage and healing at day 45. And you can appreciate that there's endothelialization with the absence of thrombosis. Conversely, if you look at the right image, the uncoded, two of the six have complete coverage with endothelialization. The remaining four 
have some degree of thrombosis on it. And that's because these were uncoated. The platelets were able to bind to the face of the device and form DRT. So I think this coding is going to be extremely important when you look at endothelization that is complete at day 45. And that was all preclinical work. So we'll see what the HEAL LA trial shows in the new simplified trial uh, that's going to be expanded here shortly. So again, looking at the Watchman Flex Pro technology, it's been, uh, you know, since the Flex Pinnacle tier data in 2019 and 2022, we had FDA approval in 2020, and now Watchman Flex Pro is approved in 2023. So the current LA indication, over 1,500 patients, it does have a DAPT indication, as you know. So aspirin and Plavix is appropriate for current commercial devices. The trial that we're looking at is a control of DAPT, then SAPT, single antiplatelet therapy versus low-dose DOAC, and one-year composite endpoint of all-cause death, stroke, systemic embolization, and major bleeding. So let me ask you two gentlemen, uh, Elliot and Joe, when you do a Watchman or LA closure device, how often do you use the DAPT indication versus OAC, number one? Elliot, you want to do that one? Yeah, so cool. I am, like I mentioned, I, we are very heavily DOAC. Um, we, you know, there's the, there's a certain subset of patients where we feel a little uncomfortable with uh, DOAC, like someone who's had recurrent major bleeding, um, but we really want to get the device in them. So those patients, that's kind of smaller subset of patients will uh, try DAPT, um, but it, it heavily DOAC driven. Yeah. yeah. Joe, how about you? I'm, I'm, you know, I got a fair amount of DRT and I, I looked through the data. I looked at the meta-analyses. I looked at the post-approval registry stuff and, you know, the data's not bad for DAPT, um, but I'm still using DOAC for 90 days after my, my watchmans and people who can tolerate that. In the high bleeding risk patients, I'm going to DAPT. Uh, so it's a little variable. I'd like to I'd like to make it more universal in terms of just a standard protocol. But so I'm using DAPT in high bleeding risk patients and DOAC in in patients that can tolerate it. Yeah, similar. I, I'm I'm similar with that. Uh, you know, kind of aligned interest in terms of high risk bleeders. I do DAPT uh, and then DOAC at 45 days, depending on what their bleeding risk is. I will say that you know in high risk bleeders, they seem to tolerate low dose DOACs better than DAPT. They get yeah. more of the nuisance bleeding in their arms with the ecchymosis, and they come in looks like they've been, you know, beaten by their spouse. And uh, <laughs> I mean, it's just awful. I call them eloquous arms. I don't know if you guys notice this when you see Watchmen patients; their arms are all blue. Oh, it's, it's awful. It really. And I'll is. be like, "Oh, those are eloquous arms." They're like, "What?" I'm like, "Yeah, yeah they're an eloquous." Like, yeah. So I find that you know, two point five of eloquous is my go to, and most people that I'm concerned about bleeding. Yeah, you know, I like, think that's uh, and hopefully this trial will help uh, delineate what the right course is. But although I do think it's not it's not, you know, drug regimen agnostic, meaning we're going to have cases where it's going to be low dose eloquis. It's going to be a case where we can do sapped and there's going to be cases where we do dapt. If they have yeah. a, piece, a recent PCI, it would make sense to do dapt in that in that cohort. So I think, uh, again, it won't be it, although we want to have it uniform and easy for us. It, I think it'll be, you know, drug regimen agnostic someday, but not not currently. Yeah. Um, so uh, this will be exciting. One year endpoint will be very interesting to see what this looks like when you talk about a control of DAPT versus SAPT, uh, SAPT indication. You put a device in, you just do aspirin. I mean, that would be remarkable. And I think some of the competitive devices uh, are leaning in that direction as well. So it'll be very interesting to see how that market shapes up. Very good. So let's move on here. One additional feature of the Watchman Flex Pro is the new three radio opaque markers. They call it the RO markers. And I think this is important. It helps delineate the shoulder of the device on fluoroscopic imaging. When you do your tug test, what you can do is go to your coaxial view where you line up all three of those dots and then take a nice tug test and picture with that in line. Some people like it. Some people don't like it. I think it's a nice added feature to understand where the shoulders are, at least by a fluoroscopic image. Yeah. You know, they're really pushing for the day when this is ice guided and fluoroscopic guided. However, Joe, you know, we've done a couple of cases now with this new adult mini TE that's about 57 percent narrower compared to, to a regular adult 4D TE. And I think the image quality is pretty impressive. If you think about 4D ice, that the crystal hertz are about 840 for 4D ice. Uh, it, for adult 4D TE probe, it's about 2,500 megahertz. Wow. This new adult mini probe that has 4D capabilities is about 22.5. So it's in line with an adult TE probe in terms of imaging quality, but 57% narrower. I mean, it's like the size of a pediatric probe. So I think it's be very interesting to see how this pans out. Is ice really going to be, 
you know, that future endeavor that a lot of industry had hoped for, when you think about uh, the quality of an adult mini probe, and you can do it under conscious sedation without GA. So it'll be a competitive market, I think, in the future for that. Well, Are you guys this, using this, ice? This is a 10 minute procedure, you know, like with with the VersaConnect and an easy deployment, I mean, these are 10 minute procedures now. So I don't see why we shouldn't be doing them with conscious sedation. I, yeah. I've dabbled with ice like most people. And, and to be honest, you know, I think, I think it does add some time to the procedure. And I do think it'll eventually be the future of this stuff, but you know, I, I still think, I still think TEE and, and, you know, uh, a 10 minute procedure is the way to go. I don't know, Elliot, what do you think about the future of ice in this space? Yeah, I mean, like you, I've done a few with ICE. I am not as sold on it as I think other people. I really, I think what Tom's saying about this low profile TE probe, because what we try to do, and this is maybe just an us thing, is try to, you know, like a lot of procedures, minimize the pain to the patient. Like we try to get you, come see us in clinic, get the procedure. And one of the ways we've done that is we don't screen, pre-screen people. Yeah. So we, we just have them come in. So TEE is just a... With, then we don't have to do a CT when we do TE. We just do a really nice TE, like you said. You know, the patient gets put under, they get a five-minute TE, and then we're done with the procedure in 15 minutes. So they're, you know, I tell the patients they're freaked out about GA. So you're going to be asleep for like a half an hour. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and if you can do this with TE, I mean, it's kind of the best of both worlds. Um, I've heard about these these uh, TE probes. I haven't had a chance to use one, so I'll try to figure out. We will. Give me a, some tips on how to how to get my hands on one. Absolutely. But, uh, so, yeah. Yeah. GE has one, New Vision, as well as Philips. Yeah. They both have uh, the adult mini T probes with 40 capability now. So it's it's remarkable. And again, the idea is just have the best image quality. You know, with 40 ice, the nice thing about that is you get one image, and you can explain from that and build off your four images. Whereas yeah. 2D, you have to get each view the RVOT view. You have to cross the septum and get your you know uh, superior pulmonary vein view. I think with the 40 technology. The NPR capabilities are are very attractive. Yeah. With this, uh, you know, mini T probe, we'll see. Again, it's fifty seven percent narrower than an adult probe, with nearly the quality of imaging as an adult forty probe. So, uh, we'll see, guys. Uh, the very exciting space in terms of imaging and uh, new technology. So, moving on here, guys. A few more slides. Again, those R markers we think will help uh, ensure device stability. We use them when we want to see a nice tug test. If there's a concern about a you know very pecknated appendage or large appendage and sizing is an issue. We'll do the tug test after we line up those three markers and do a nice angio with it. And then obviously the, the big boy here. So the great news is that it's a 40 millimeter device. It's exciting. It's going to increase our range by about 25% larger. So the current device, 35 millimeter, could close up to 31.5 millimeter appendages. This is going to close up to 36 millimeters. So increase our, our size market by about 25%. When you deploy this one, it does tend to pop out a little bit more robust. Uh, as you can imagine, it's the same size delivery system, the 14 French, 14 and a half French. And you have a 40 millimeter device compared to a 20 millimeter device. Joe, you can imagine pushing one of those out. It's a little, little different feel when it pops out the end of that delivery system. So take your time and do a nice control delivery. Got it. Again, uh, the recommendation that we had was, uh, you know, use it uh, in that larger, you know, up to 36 Conservative estimates were a 6% increase in the oscillator diameter. We're seeing about 8 to 10% increase in usage. I think we probably will use it more in those borderline cases that were 35 implants where we implanted deep, like the image on the right, versus a true neoosteum at the true osteum implant. I think it, it, it may be closer to 10% in terms of expanded treatment population. And Tom, just to piggyback on that, you know, <clears throat> in terms of sizing charts and choosing your device on the day of your procedures has, has the flex pro changed your kind of decision-making algorithm at all for sizing versus the flex. I mean, intuitively it shouldn't cause it's pretty much a similar device in terms of its mechanics, but right. is it pretty much the same for you in terms of your sizing decisions? Yeah. Great, great question. Not in the lower end, you know, the twenties to the, you know, 30 range, 31 millimeter range, but I would say the higher end, absolutely. Yes. The bigger device now, like this image shows on the right, instead of trying to, undersize a 35 with a deep implant, I absolutely will reach for a 40 and get a good neoosteum at the true osteum delivery deployment with a good compression. So Got I it. think in that regard, at the higher end, yes, at the lower end has not changed. And one thing I struggle with with Watchman, you know, when you look at the DRT data, it's clear that one of the predictors of DRT is deep deployments. And <clears throat> I sometimes struggle with, do I deploy it, especially in challenging anatomies, do I deploy it with 
a moderate posterior shoulder and it's more proximal or do I try to get it deeper and a little bit beyond the ostium? What's, what is, if you have to make that trade off between a sh like a little shoulder versus a kind of a deeper deployment, wh what's your decision making on that? Absolutely. Always go more proximal. When you create a neo ostium, you can have DRT risk that I think is higher, particularly if they have any sort of advanced diastolic dysfunction. If they Got have it. blunted pulmonary veins, if they have smoke in the left atrium proper, they have atriums over five, five and a half centimeters. If you do a deep implant, I think that's a patient that's at risk. And that's a patient I might look at like a Laos 3 trial candidate and keep them on OAC even low dose much longer with, with closure of the appendage. So those are patients I've seen DRT form. Blunted PVs in the absence of MR, dilated atriums over five and a half centimeters, spontaneous echo contrast in the LA proper. Those are patients I want a big, nice proximal shoulder, a muffin top, if you will, and uh, I keep them on OEC longer. Absolutely. Got it. Now, see, this is, there's so much nuance to this procedure that I think people don't appreciate, and I think that's one of them. Yeah. You have to make these trade-off decisions when you're doing the day of the procedure, and I think having a knowledge of the data and, and what lends itself to a higher risk of DRT is super important. Elliot, what, do you have any thoughts on that? Because I feel like it's a common dilemma we see on Watchman Days. No, I, to, I totally agree with you. I, and I 100%, I mean, Tom's an expert in this, but I agree with, I mean, I think when me and you learned this procedure, we learned it from the same people, Joe, me and Joe, um, shoulders were kind of felt of as the enemy with 2.5. It was, we, I, I don't know if you remember that, but I was felt like we were taught no shoulder, no shoulder. But now, I mean, when we, we didn't know then, this is what we know now about deep implants and the really dramatically increased rate of DRT. And that's what we're really trying to avoid, like you said. I mean, a little leak is a little leak, but a, a thrombus on a device can be kind of, I mean, someone have, end up having to have surgery. Yeah. So I've had to kind of change my mind and my mindset to accept that shoulder and understand that that's actually a much safer implant for the patient. Obviously, there's limitations to that. You need to make sure that the fabric's covering the osteum, et cetera. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's taken a little bit of, you know, mental gymnastics for me to, to, to accept that. But I, I now see it in, in, in real world practice that, you know, these patients with these a little bit more shoulder than I would love to see don't tend to have any issues. Yeah, yes. exactly right. So I think back to your point, Joe, you know, have the neo ostium proximal or at the true ostium, a muffin top is what we're going for. I love it. Tom, that was a tour de force, man. I love it. I'm, I'm, I'm more excited than I was before we started this about getting Watchman Flex Pro. I think it's going to be, it's going to be a big deal. Um, just a couple of questions I had. You know, you are the number one Watchman implanter in the world. You're obviously a fantastic operator, and you know the device space super well. Do you have any tips or tricks for some of our our, our users, uh, Murmur MD, in terms of what they can do to help build their Watchman program? Things that you've done to increase your volume and and um, and just improve your throughput absolutely you know keep in mind you know the, the, commercially the penetration is like only nine to ten percent for commercial devices in the u.s so meaning patients that could meet indication for this only ten percent are being treated currently now we've done a tremendous job here in the in the southern arizona community and, and arizona in general where we go out and give talks we give luncheons seminars patient directed seminars referral seminars to say guys this device is here here's the data I show them a similar slide deck saying this is the newest technology. And I think that is really what you have to do. I mean, you know, our penetration is about 15 to 20% here because we're, you know, go, we go out and do a lot of uh, grassroots uh, talks and seminars uh, between lunches and weekends, just to share the technology. And I think that's what you have to do. Know the data. You could show 10 to 15 slides of the data and have a patient centric or patient directed seminar then have a referral-based slide deck to show what the data looks like. Because obviously some patients don't need to know the intricacies of the, of the trials. But I think having those two separate decks go out and as much as you can, you know, proselyze about this and, and share the data and say, hey, this is, this is what is here. You know, so many patients come to ERs that have bleeds from falls, traumatic bodily injury, high NRs, you know, intolerance to DOAX. I mean, the indications are just building up in this in this space and i think you know if you're passionate about this closure then uh get out and uh, educate the grassroots no, absolutely man yeah. one thing i've done i found really really helpful it's significantly increased our volume is <clears throat> they have great therapy awareness posters yep and i had them put those posters in every single cardiology room in our clinic so as the patients are sitting waiting for their doctor to come in they're looking at this poster and they're like oh shit i could 
I, I qualify for that. I want a Watchman. And then <laughs> they tell their doctor about it and then their doctor refers them. So yeah. that's one thing that we've done that's really easy, just kind of like a chip shot thing. Just call your therapy awareness yeah. rep and tell them to bring in some posters. So therapy Elliot, awareness. That, that's stuff? the key term. That's exactly right. Therapy awareness from a patient centric to referral centric, you know, understand where these patients are and get to them. You know, Boston's done a great job about doing these commercials and they'll target uh, different populations on the internet. I, I think, you know, getting out, keep in mind that the national penetration for commercial devices is just around 10% of people that meet current IFU indications for LA closure. That's crazy. Wow. Yeah, this is, the, I mean, the whole structural space, I feel like is is ripe for, for some of this. Elliot, anything you guys have done to increase your volume and get more patients on the table? You know, uh, I'll turn that into a statement and then a question for Tom. So one thing is the same kind of thing as Tom. I and mean, we've been really focused on, on making people aware, particularly the referring community. I don't think we've done as good of a job. Um, well, I don't think anybody's done as good of a job with the patients as he has. But with the, with the local cardiology community, just really highlighting. And, and I think also to say your own program, say, look, these are our rates of coming off uh, anticoagulation. If you can tell them my rates are close to, you know, high 90s of your patient is going to be off anticoagulation. That resonates with the referrings. But yeah, similar kind of stuff, just getting out into the community and, and letting people know. And even people within your office, like your, you know, we have a really awesome nursing staff here. We have a, a, a room where the nurses, they answer a lot of the patient phone calls and stuff and just informing them. And they'll even come to me sometimes and say, hey, you know, I talked to Mr. Y or Mrs. X and and they, you know, they called me because their arms or they have the Eloquus arms. And yeah. you know, we, we talk about that with them. But what question I had for kind of the dovetail with for Tom is one issue, I would say, probably the, the thing that's bothering me the most, we just had a big discussion about this in our office yesterday is if someone refers a patient to me for a tab, I would say, and I don't know the exact numbers, but I'm just making this up, probably high 90s percent that patient, I'm going to do a tab on them. If it's indicated, obviously, mm -hmm. it's serious, et cetera. If I get a referral for a watchman, there's probably a, I would, I'm again, I'm, I'm just kind of guessing, but it's around only about 50% of those people end up actually getting one. Huh. And I, and I'm wondering how, because it's, there's a couple factors. There's one is we try to consolidate, we're not doing, you know, 500 cases, we're doing a hundred and something. So we're, we're consolidating those into a couple days a month, do like five to six. Um, and I think one is the wait time, which I can obviously work on as a, as a program, but I just, I feel like, how do you overcome that issue of your, you can't, you have to be honest with the patient. This is not a procedure that's going to, you know, like with AS where you're going to die. You know, if you have heart failure admissions times three and you have a mean gradient of 60, you're going to be dead in a year. You can't tell that there's not that, I don't want to say scare factor, but something like that. So how do you talk to the patients to get your, because I'm assuming your rate of referral to implant is significantly higher than mine. Yeah, it's a it's a great question, and it's kind of the the coup de grace of LA closure uh, in terms of referring. You know, I think the biggest thing is having patients educated, making sure they understand that their lifetime chance of having a major bleed is quite elevated. So I will discuss with them their has blood score and their bleeding risk. Um, I think having that a simple you know graft showing that patients what their bleeding risk is, their ER visit risk, etc., is really powerful. But I will say that was probably five years ago you know, more contemporary in clinic, literally uh, patients are begging me to do Watchmen. They see <laughs> the commercials, they have friends, and probably the biggest referral is their neighbors or their family members that they're out hiking with. And they come and say, hey, you know, you did a Watchmen on my, on my book club member and we go hiking on Saturdays here in the mountains and uh, they're off their blood thinner and I have these eloquence arms as Joe alluded to, you know, it's, it's, it, that is probably one of the biggest referrals over the last year has been self-referrals from either friends or family. So I think the word is finally out for us. I think you guys have to crack through that. And that's where those patient seminars, I do them on weekends. On a Saturday morning, I'll do, you know, a 45-minute talk. I do the first 20 minutes, it's it's a it's a slide deck. And the second half of it is Q&A. And I get more questions on the Q&A about non-AFib related stuff, heart failure, AS, valve disease, and they love it. They just love to have, patients love to have the attention of a physician, a cardiologist, to ask them questions. And I think that builds a reputation for LA closure in general. And uh, that's been our, our one of our biggest uh, referral bases over the last probably year. That's a really that's great all. point. That's a great, uh, thank you for that. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I will, the, what you said about the patients knowing other people have done it, 
the patients I don't really have to say anything to are the ones who have friends who had it. Yeah. Those yeah. patients you walk in, they're like, I want this. Yep. You don't even need to tell yeah. me. I read it. My friend has it. Just tell me what day you can do this. And that's you where I'm at now. Them. Probably half of my referrals now are, are self-referrals because they know somebody who had a watch. It. Whether it's the Boston Scientific commercials they had launched here, whether it's the patient awareness uh, posters as Joe does, we have those as well, or it's just a friend or family member in their book club. I mean, the word is out fun. So hopefully we'll see that penetration continue to ascend or at least at 50% in the next five years. I mean, just again... 10 to 15% penetration for a technology has been on label since what, 2015. I mean, it's just, uh, it's unfortunate. Yeah, totally right. We have a lot of work to do boys. A lot of work to do. Awesome. Well, on that note, Tom, Elliot, thank you so much, guys. This was a really good discussion. I loved it. I think this will be really informative for everyone looking at it and, uh, have a great day. Let's close some appendages. Awesome guys. Thanks so much. Joe. Appreciate Elliot. Yeah. Pleasure guys. Take care. Thanks, Remember, Tom. Murmur MD. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. All right, Zach, you can stop recording. And then um, if you guys just